just don't. Okay. <clears throat> no? Okay. We can start. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is my uh, enormous pleasure to, to be the day chairman of this uh, workshop that is in honor of uh, the retirement speech of Professor Ton Conan Ton, uh, which uh, retired in February and uh, is where now they have the opportunity of coming together, which is also a very special thing. I think we most, mostly miss this kind of opportunities to see each other, to talk to each other in the last 18 months. And I hope this stays like this. You never know. Um, it's, it's a very interesting symposium for those of you who are in the field, and I think also for those of you who are not in the field, because we have a very broad uh, uh, discussion from different experts from industry, but also from academia. Um, the first speaker we have today, I need to switch, press the button, let's see if it works. Yes, it's Peter Winzer, all the way from the United States of America. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Peter is a long-standing, uh, very, uh, very, very valued member of our community. Uh, I will not even begin starting stating all his jobs and, and things he's done for our community. Um, he is currently uh, part of Nubis, Nubis Communication for spending many years in Bell Labs. And he's going to talk to us about uh, the challenge of scaling capacity uh, using optical networks. So, Peter, please take it away. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for this very kind introduction. And thanks also uh, for the opportunity to speak here. And, Tom, this is all for you, of course. So, uh, many congratulations, and we'll, we'll get back to that. Uh, I wish I had been able to be here in person, but uh, I don't need to explain you, <laughs> to you why, why this is not possible this year. So initially, I wanted to talk about capacity scaling through spatial parallelism from subsea cables to short-reach optical links until Ton told me that uh, there is a large fraction in the audience of family and friends who doesn't know optical communications so well, so I changed the talk completely. And uh, the first half of this talk uh, is meant for all of those who uh, don't know a lot about um, what uh, us nerds are doing here, um, fiber optic communication. So maybe you get some, and digital communications, to get some uh, appreciation and some uh, insight of, uh, of what we are doing and how we are doing things. And of course, I will also talk about um, fiber optics and uh, scaling in fiber optics in the second half, which is more than uh, meant to be for, for the experts in, in the audience. Okay, so let me start with something very important, and that's that many things uh, that we encounter uh, in our daily lives grow exponentially. So what does that mean? It means that things grow by a constant percentage every year. Say, for example, 50%. In year one, you have an amount of one. In year two, you have 1.5. Then you grow by 50%. You have 2.3 and so on. So all, you always multiply with 1.5. And if you plot that, this looks like this. That's an exponential growth curve. And um, because it looks a little bit uh, like a hockey stick, we sometimes refer to this as a hockey stick curve. Now, it's very hard to... Um, to to uh, in our minds to extrapolate how 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 much will we have in a hundred years or in fifteen years or in twenty years? That's very hard for us to to extrapolate such uh, exponential curves, and that's why um, in engineering what we do is we plot things on what we call a logarithmic scale. So a logarithmic scale just compresses the y-axis here into a very weird-looking uh, scale. Like uh, you have one here, the step from one to two is big, and to three, then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the steps. So you have one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 10, and the next step would be 20, not 11 and 12. So that's, that's a very particular scale. But on this logarithmic scale, the nice thing is that this exponential hockey stick curve becomes a straight line. And straight lines are super easy for us humans to extrapolate and to see what's going on after 15 years, after 20 years, after 100 years. We just need to um, take a ruler and uh, draw a line. And it's also very easy then for us to see what happens if um, a quantity starts not at one, but starts at two. 
and has the exact same 50% growth rate. So from this curve here, I could never say what's going on. Here, I can very easily say that. If it's the same growth rate, it's going to be a parallel line. It's just offset from the original line. If the growth rate changes, like here, from 50% per year to 100% per year, then the slope changes. So you have exactly twice the slope here because it's twice the rate. So that's how um, we visualize things um, of exponential growth. And uh, that's very important um, in this talk going forward. Let me give you some examples for exponential growth. One of them is the stock market. Um, so this is the a linear chart, the hockey stick chart of uh, the growth of, of the NASDAQ um, index. And you see here from here, it's very hard to say how many percent does this change. But then you plot this logarithmically and you see that it's very well approximated by a straight line and it's 10% per year. And if you had invested something in 1970, you would have um, a hundredfold gain uh, today. Uh, a similar or a different example for the similar thing is the world population. You see here again the exponential um, growth on a linear scale and the same thing on a logarithmic scale. And of course, you could now fit a straight line through that, but um, that doesn't match it really very well. So you can really fit multiple straight lines. So you see that exponential growth can change over time. And there was a period with this exponential growth, then uh, the population accelerated in growing, and now uh, the population is no longer growing as fast as it used to grow um, in the 1900s. You can um, make very interesting statements that way. So now, um, as a next thing, I have a, I have a, um, a uh, sort of a, a question. If anybody can guess what that kind of exponential growth is, or if this is even exponential growth. You see here, there is something, and I'm not telling you right now what it is, but uh, I let you guess in your mind what it could be. Something that was won in the 1900s, like early 1900s, late 1800s, then it was two by 1970, and then it really took off. There is an exponential growth here going on um, from three to seven up until uh, 2010 or something like that. And I predict that this cannot grow forever. Uh, this, this is essentially where it, where it is, and it will completely flatten out. Uh, so exponential growth can never go on forever. And if I click, then you'll see what I mean, because that's the number of razors in a, in a, uh, the number of blades in a razor. So um, I think we would all agree that we will not see 100 blades in a razor in 10 years from now. So here you see how exponential growth can really um, be a good model for some um, period of time, but then it also has to stop. Everything has to have an end. We can't grow forever uh, infinitely. Okay, so let's get to, uh, to traffic growth uh, in the data center, and that is exactly wh why, where we need that exponential growth. What you see here is the traffic, the bits that are shoved um, uh, through between computers um, by Google, and that is, again, an exponential growth. There are some measurement errors in, in here in that time period, but this is an exponential growth, and you plot that on a logarithmic scale, you get a, essentially a, a straight line. And that's a 70% per year uh, traffic growth. So what, what does that mean? 70% per year means in five years, you have a 14-fold growth. In 10 years, you grow by 200 times, 15 years by 3,000 times, and in 20 years by 4,000 times. This means that from 2000 to today, Google has grown its traffic by a factor of 40,000. Now that's an enormous number. And that's why it, it's so valuable to plot this on a linear scale because it's just impossible to imagine these large numbers. But don't be surprised, just think back. Back in 2000, uh, we all had 56 kilobit dial-up modems at home. Today, we have several hundred uh, megabit per second internet connectivity. I looked it up in the Netherlands is 156 megabit per second is the average intel, uh, internet connectivity per household. So that's a factor of 3000 in 20 years, which corresponds to a growth rate of 50% per year. So these enormous numbers, while they seem really science fiction in a, in a chart like that, if you look back, you have all experienced these numbers. And there are many other examples um, for that as well. So now there is a problem, and the problem is that the data processing capability 
does not keep up with that. Data processing capability, that's what microchips do. That's what Moore's law is doing. So you see here Moore's law, that's the uh, fundamental law, one of the two fundamental laws that has governed um, uh, our, our lives really for the, past, uh, for the past 80 or so years and has led to everything we know about the um, communication and information society. So that's the, uh, that's the law that describes the number of transistors on a microchip. And the number of transistors on a microchip doubles every two years. And that has been true for a very long time, uh, and it, it still is true. So people have predicted the breakdown of Moore's law many, many, many times uh, along this line, but it's still true because engineers come up with clever solutions to extend Moore's law using um, newer technology. But still, Moore's law only goes um, such that data processing can improve by 40% per year. So you see there's a gap that is opening up. But before I come to discussing that gap, I'll just tell you a little bit about transistors and, and microchips so that we're all on the same page, what that really means. So if you really boil it down to basics, um, if you look at all these Intel processors or AMD or whatever, you name it, you take a processor and inside there are billions of transistors. And each transistor is nothing else than a switch. It's like a light switch on and off or uh, an electric electricity switch on and off. That's really what a transistor is. And you integrate billions of those transistors. And the first transistor was uh, built in um, 1947 um, at Bell Labs. You see here the team, um, uh, Shockley, Bardeen and Bratan, who uh, built that first transistor. And remember that year, 1947. That's when the transistor was first invented. And in the exact same year, there was something else happening. This guy, Claude Shannon, um, essentially invented digital communications. He wrote this very, very famous paper that uh, establishes an extremely important uh, principle. And that principle is, if you only use zeros and ones or bits of information or switches or transistors, um, that's all the same thing, if you only use these two states, then any information, audio, video, whatever you want, can be perfectly, and, and the important thing is perfectly processed, stored, and communicated, which is a complete paradigm shift. Um, because uh, if you remember the records, uh, the, the vinyl records, uh, there was nothing like perfect. Uh, first of all, you had the, the, of, the more often you play the vinyl record, the, uh, the noisier it got, and then you had to replicate it using an audio tape, and then you copied the audio tape, and then you copied the audio tape again. And by the time you gave it to your fifth friend, um, the quality was horrible. And that was just uh, 30 years ago. Uh, so you see how, uh, how that digital information has really totally revolutionized uh, our lives. And it's not a coincidence that these two uh, groups, this transistor group, and this information theorist worked at the same place at the same time, because this is just the perfect marriage. Transistors as switches that you can integrate to be billions of them in one microprocessor and information theory that tells you that you can perfectly process, store and communicate information using just simple switches. That is a perfect marriage that has driven our society over the last um, 80 years or so, like, like nothing else. And that has enabled going from analog media, like vinyls and records, to digital media at first, and then to the cloud in the next step. So uh, today, everything is really stored in the cloud. And what is the cloud? The cloud is just a collection of data centers. It's buildings, huge buildings, that house thousands and hundreds of thousands of computers. And uh, everything that we are doing today uses the cloud to re retrieve information and to process information there. So you might ask, how big is the cloud? So the cloud is really all these warehouses. And what we did at Bell Labs, uh, David Nielsen did that. Um, he went to Google Earth, and Google Earth has a history function. So you can scroll back the maps in history, and you can look how uh, a site that houses, for example, a Google data center evolved over the years. You can trace it back to the time when cows were grazing on these pastures. 
So uh, by doing that, you can see how quickly did the clouds grow. And what you see here when you plot these um, data points here, again, on a, on a logarithmic scale, because that's an exponential scaling thing, like, uh, like so many other things. So you see that the data center real estate has been growing at 40% per year, year over year over year. And that's the cloud of the big four. So these big four companies, they really represent the cloud. And if you look where we are today, we are very close to 100 million square feet. That's not that big. It sounds great in, in square feet, but it's really not that big. It's three kilometers by three kilometers. So the entire size of the cloud is about three kilometers by three kilometers, but all of these are stuffed with servers. So it, it is big if you think of that in terms of uh, computers. So um, in order to bridge that gap between data traffic needs and data processing capabilities given by Moore's law, you need more and more uh, data centers. And that gap is, a re is covered by real estate. So you, you use parallelism by putting more and more data centers to make sure that we can um, have the traffic that our society requires. Now, there is another big problem, and if you look at the uh, bottom side of these microchips, there is a lot of contacts, electrical contacts, and sometimes they are solder balls, sometimes they are um, like spring-like contacts, where you connect this microchip to a printed circuit board. And the problem is that you cannot get signals at arbitrary speed out of, this, uh, of these solder balls, and you cannot get an arbitrary number because they, can, uh, they have to be a certain size, otherwise you can't align them properly um, on your printed circuit board. So there is, a, there is a size limitation here, which leads to a chip I.O. limitation. And the per lane or per solder ball um, bit rate that you can escape from a packaged microprocessor is only growing at 20% per year. And here you see exactly this thing, right? You see one straight line that has twice the slope as the other straight line. Both grow exponentially, but they grow at different rates. And that's a big problem because it means that there is a gap and the gap is widening and widening and widening over time. And that's, uh, that's a really big problem for microprocessors today. Um, and especially for high-end microprocessors like the, um, the AI and machine learning processes that uh, promise us so many good things, but they won't happen if the hardware is not able to catch up. So there is uh, an effort right now to move optics, optical fiber closer to the chip in order to, is, to allow uh, to escape all that um, bandwidth. Now, today, nearly all information really touches optical fiber. Optical fiber is uh, a very, very thin piece of glass. I have about a thousand fibers here in this bundle. You see a thousand fibers, and each fiber is as thin as a hair, a human hair. And um, each fiber can carry about 10 million high definition video streams. So those thousand fibers that I'm holding in my hand here can send a high definition video stream to every single person on this planet. That's how much information you can get through these strands of glass using light. Um, and not surprisingly, fiber is deployed everywhere. So you have optical fiber cables that connect um, uh, North America with Europe, uh, North America with, uh, with Asia and um, Africa and uh, everywhere between Europe and Africa. Around Africa, you have rings of optical fiber being deployed in the ocean. You have fiber networks spanning entire continents. You have fiber um, in overhead, like on power lines, uh, connecting to homes through fiber to the home. You have fiber connecting the network to the cell towers, because before the signal gets to the uh, antenna so that you can communicate with your cell phone, it needs to go most of the time through fiber to the cell tower. Then you have fiber in those data centers and you even have fiber as part of solutions on circuit boards and even within microchips, you are starting to have fiber. So today there is about 10 billion kilometers of fiber um, installed around the globe. That means 
250,000 times around the world. You can wrap that string of fiber 250,000 times around the world. That's how much fiber is deployed uh, today. Or you can go 13,000 times to the moon and back or 33 times to the sun and back. Just to give you a, a sense of scale, how much fiber is installed. Of course, that fiber doesn't take a lot of room because it's, so, it's as thin as a hair, but it's super powerful in transporting information. So the fiber is really the workhorse of the internet. And um, the internet really consists of many different networks from cellular to core networks spanning continents to metro networks uh, spanning cities, data center and access and local area networks. And that's really where Tom uh, specializes in. So if, if you ever have any questions about access or local area and networks here, ask Tom. If Tom doesn't know the answer, then there's a very good chance that nobody, nobody in the world knows the answer. So that's really Tom's strength here. So um, let me now go to, uh, to the, a little bit more technical uh, part, talking about breaking points, how communications are at the breaking point today. So if you look, uh, that's, uh, that might be a little bit more for, for the specialists uh, in the audience. So if you look at the... Um, growth of per wavelength interface rates over the last um, 20, 30, 40 years, you see a very nice, again, exponential growth. So a linear curve on, an, on a logarithmic scale. And those are research results. And here you see the corresponding symbol rates. But what is really very striking here is that since 2016, since this OFC post deadline paper here that showed around 200 gigabaud, there hasn't been any progress. There has been no progress in symbol rates. So symbol rates are saturating. We should be at 800 gigabots today, but we are not. And that's a very clear sign that something is giving. This is a sign that exponential growth cannot go forever, uh, go on forever, and things are starting to break. So I asked myself, why is that? Um, is it because researchers have gotten lazy? Is it because there is a lack of research funding? Or is there something more fundamental? And we really don't know. I think there is something very fundamental going on, but I haven't figured it out yet. Uh, what exactly is the, is the thing, fundamental thing that limits us from going much higher than uh, 200 gigabaud? And you see the same thing, by the way, in commercially deployed uh, systems. So I don't want to go into all the details, but you see the same, the same saturation effect going on. And um, I'll just skip over that. And you also see the same thing in electrical traces, by the way. So what I showed before was uh, optical uh, per wavelength interface rates, but optical chip lane, uh, electrical chip lanes show the same thing. We had to go to PAM4 to go uh, even to 50 gigabit and then 100 gigabit. And now people are talking about 200 gigabit, but I don't think so. Um, uh, because if you look at the frequency roll off, which is very, very severe frequency roll off of the channel, you see that at 56 gigabaud, um, so at, at 100 gigabit per second uh, PAM4, uh, you can go about 60 millimeters of electrical trace length using uh, with an 8 dB channel loss uh, at Nyquist frequency. So that's, um, that's a pretty severe roll off. So if you now double your uh, symbol rate to 100 gigabaud to go to 200 gigabit PAM4, what you do is you either need 60 dB more of equalization, which costs you enormously in terms of power, or you have to reduce the size of your trace length to less than 30 millimeters. And that's a pretty severe constraint. And that's also why people go to optics now, because the trace lengths get so limited that from the microchip to the next optical transponder, you can only have a few centimeters um, of electrical trace. And that's exactly the reason why people look into co-packaged optics these days. And uh, by the way, the same um, is going on in fiber capacity. So when I said that there is 10 million of high definition video streams uh, per single fiber, that refers to this wavelength division multiplexed uh, point here. But these points are very strongly saturating as well. And here we know that there, that there is a fundamental uh, reason for that. And that's, again, this guy, Shannon, who, um, who showed us how to calculate that limit. 
So there is um, a limit how much you can transport over fiber. And the longer you go, the less you can transport. That's always a, a rule uh, in, in communications. If you go zero distance, you can transport infinite amount of, common, of information. If you go an infinite distance, you can transport zero information. And the reality is anywhere in between. So we are running against very hard limits, both in the per lane interface rate and in the uh, per fiber capacity. Uh, but luckily, there is a solution, and the solution is parallelism. It's the same as deploying multiple data centers. If you don't have enough room in one data center, we are now looking into parallel optical paths. You have these fiber cables that contain 3,456 fibers per cable. Those are reality today, but that's not good enough uh, because they lead to massive uh, trenches with conduits like that. We want to integrate. So we go to multi-core and multi-mode fibers to leverage parallelism. The important thing is that the technology for that exists today, and we, we, we are confident we can scale into the next 20 years using an enormous amount of fiber, uh, which is okay. It can be done, and integration can only make it better from here. And I think Kevin is talking a lot about integration. So um, with this, uh, ad multos annos, Tom, uh, my very, very best wishes for a fulfilling and not too lazy retirement. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. You really took us on a wild ride from, uh, from the 1940s all the way to now. Uh, there's some time for questions, if people have questions for Peter. Peter Windsor. I, I, I had the question about exponential growth. It's now very much uh, in the mode to consider whether we need to continue to grow exponentially, because what it does to our planet. What is your, your opinion about this? Do we need to continue to grow exponentially all the time? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. And I think some, you don't really have to grow exponentially in traffic because there is so much junk that is being transported, right? I mean, if we count you, you out refer all the advertisement. To, you refer to cat, cat videos. Yeah, 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 e e okay. exactly. Okay. So there, there is a lot of uh, inefficiencies in the network, and um, I think that's, uh, that's one of the next steps to really save uh, on making sure we do data compression in a good way and we only transport useful information because not all information is useful, as you very well know. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, there's a question in the crowd, please. Could you hear, uh, Peter? There was a question. Oh, could, oh sorry. So, the question was yeah. s stating that with light you, you can go in three dimensions, if I understood correctly. In terms of spatial dimensions, you mean? Spatial dimensions. What is the next dimension? I think that so, was the question. Right. I mean, you can go in three, in three dimensions if you are not guided in a waveguide. In a, the waveguide itself is a linear uh, thing, but within the waveguide, you have optical modes, many optical modes, and you can use those as your third dimension if you want. Those are, those give you an, an infinite basis of, uh, of further dimensions by which you can scale capacity. Hmm. Okay, thank you. But yes. if you want to do 3D space, then you have to do free space optical beams, and that's exactly what Tom is doing, by the way, and I'm sure he's <laughs> going to talk about that. Tom, it's an invitation to say something. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Hi, Peter. Uh, terrific talk. Thanks hey, a lot. Sorry. Thanks a lot. Uh, you, you clearly outlined uh, the limits there are still in optical fiber and have to do about it. But indeed, you already pointed out. What, what about wireless then? And can we put that one in the game? And where is it? Somewhere, right? Absolutely. No, we can, we can do optical wireless. The only problem with optical wireless, um, especially in countries where there is fog, and maybe in the Netherlands there is fog sometimes, <laughs> is that light doesn't travel very well through foggy weather. You all, I mean, you, you all know that because you can't see through fog, and uh, that means you can also not communicate very well uh, through fog using optical, or when it's raining, or when it's snowing. All these things are a limit 
to optical communications in free space. But within the building, of course, within the building there is no fog, there is no rain, hopefully. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so within the building, uh, optical um, free space is a, is a great thing. And it will absolutely happen. That, there is no question about that. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Peter. In view of time, uh, we will have to move to the next speaker. Peter, you are uh, more than welcome to stay online to listen to the other speakers. I hope you have the time for it. And I, I will really, definitely do so. And I really want uh, to thank, thank you, you again. Thank you very much again. Thank you on behalf of everybody. Thank you. So I press this button, I think. Yes, it worked. Okay, so uh, our next speaker is, is... Oh, yes, the microphone. Thank you. Oh, careful. Our next speaker is Kevin Williams. He's the current uh, chair... Uh, chairman of the uh, PHI group in the electrical engineering department, and he's going to talk, well, your slides are here, but he's going to talk about photonic integrations, I hope. Yes. Oh, okay, very good. Thank you. I'll just get these slides up. We see it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll talk to the topic of integrating photonics, uh, and I hope uh, we can really make that connection between this new generation of chip-scale integrated photonic circuits and the challenges we've just heard about, and I think we'll hear a little bit more about from the next speaker as well. I've taken this slide uh, from one of Peter's recent publications. Uh, I knew Peter would speak first, so I thought it would be nice and polite to make the link. And we see all his exponentials in all their glory. Uh, and they're all going pretty persistently up. This is telling us that we're using more and more data. And we don't see the end in sight at the moment. We've heard a little bit about the techniques that we're using to transport data in our communication networks. We're using more colors of light, wavelengths. We're using more symbols. Uh, we're, we're using space in new ways. Uh, and, of course, we're getting faster. So all these techniques are being widely deployed, but we still need to go faster. We need more parallelism. Uh, we need uh, higher levels of modulation. So that's something I'll speak to and the types of research that are needed for that. Is that going to work? Good. So where do we need it? Well, we all encounter the internet in our everyday lives. We have it in the workplace at home, on the move. And photonics has a role in all of this. At the moment, much of these connections, we see it as a wireless electrical connection. But you see in the middle, yeah, there are concepts out there maturing in industry, and certainly Tom will speak to this topic, where we're able to use light in the wireless connection, offering security, efficiency, uh, and bandwidth. And the pressures we have on internet now, it needs to be everywhere ubiquitous, it needs to be wireless, uh, and it needs to be instant. We need it instant for, for things for fun, I guess, gaming, video, but also things that are really valuable to our society, if you don't go for that anyway, such as e-commerce, uh, telemedicine, all sorts of applications that are coming on stream, and in fact are already a part of our lives. We've got billions of users now, we've got tens of billions of connections coming on stream with all sorts of technologies that we're already familiar with, with virtual assistants, smart fridges, you name it. It's coming on stream now. So we've got a decade of challenges ahead. Uh, we've got challenges in terms of immediacy. You know, how do we remove those delays when we're clicking on that, uh, that must-have purchase and we want it instantly, but the computer's hung up? You know, how do we move, move on from that? How do we get the bandwidth we need so that our video streams are not hanging up every two, two, two three minutes? Uh, but as we heard in the questioning, we care about the impact on the environment, on our world now. So green energy use of the internet is getting out of control. There's another exponential going on there. Uh, by some estimates, we're approaching 10% of electrical use. Uh, this becomes a serious problem when we scale up our use of ICT technology. So we need to remove energy, and we need to become more sustainable, reducing the critical materials in all our components. 
Uh, and light has a lot of answers. We've heard already that we can guide light inside of chips, microchips. We can transport over fiber. And from the question at the back, we can control in space. And one of the nice things about the photon, it doesn't see capacitance, doesn't see inductance. So we have a fundamental physical process uh, particle that doesn't necessarily lose energy. And it can travel, well, at the speed of light. So what we need now, if we really want to make impact, is a way to mass manufacture photonic circuits, you know, to embed photonics in many, uh, many of our everyday uh, technologies. Uh, and Peter's already hi highlighted the route to do that. Electronics has given us a rather nice template of how to embed photonics everywhere. On the left, the first transistor that Peter proudly presented from his uh, former employer. A little bit bulky back then, uh, but now if we look in the middle, the way we produce transistors, large plate-sized wafers with many microchips on them, and each of these chips of order 10 billion transistors. Quite a long way in a few decades. Uh, and because of that, we've enabled mobile computing. Something you couldn't imagine, I think, back in the first days of transistor technology. And I think something similar is going to be happening with photonics. Today, we have relatively simple components. We're starting to integrate quite complicated chips, but the functionality, I think we still haven't really imagined the full potential. I'll start off with an example of a chip uh, that we've designed at Eindhoven. Uh, that gives you an idea of what can be made at the same time. And this is the key to integration. How much can you put, how many different functions can you put in the same piece of semiconductor? And this is high risk, isn't it? Does my, oh, it does work. So we see we can make lasers and we can program the wavelength. We can tune the color just by changing the electronic signals. We can put modulators on so that we can convert data from electronics into optics. We can filter. We can combine lots of different colors at the same time and get hundreds of gigabits off the same chip. Uh, and we have detectors. All this on the same chip. And one, one of the big achievements, I think, within Eindhoven as well has been to bring this technology together so that you can do all of this uh, in a fast way. You can design circuits for almost arbitrary applications. tell you a little bit about what it takes to build these circuits and give you some examples of them. I'll start with the building blocks. And the way we go about it, uh, we grow our semiconductor wafers in vacuum systems on the left there. Uh, for, for our own technologies, they can be quite small compared to electronics, about three or four inch. But these sizes are going up because the demand for this technology goes up. Then we use lithography, a way of making patterns on these wafers, similar in a way to old-fashioned photography, but using really quite precise precision equipment from vendors such as ASML, where you can control the patterns with nanometer precision. And then you have steps, repeated steps of etching and patterning, etching and patterning, to create three-dimensional structures uh, to make our lasers, our detectors, and the like. And increasingly, on the right, you're seeing that we're automating a lot of the, the measurement systems so that we can really understand the impact of nanometer scale variations, which are so critical uh, to controlling light of the way we want. And by doing this, we're really making some progress. Yeah, the speeds that we can achieve with photonic devices, uh, here, this is probably the only technical graph you'll see from me, uh, but um, here you you see that we're getting up beyond 100 gigahertz, which, you know, if, if you'd asked me 10 years ago what was possible in photonics, I'd have been surprised, I think. But we're starting to realize now that you know, the limitations are primarily in the electronic connections. We're now at a point where electronics is limiting us, I think. I think we know how to go significantly beyond this. Uh, and we're not compromising on the efficiency, how much, how much of the light we can convert back to electronics, uh, and at the same time, we're reducing our footprints. These devices are getting very, very small. What we're learning is that the smaller you get, the higher performance we can get as well, which is quite nice. 
We've done some very nice work uh, with the ASML scan lithography to really reduce losses and control uh, the reproducibility of photonic circuits. Now, this is a detail of a RAID waveguide grating invented by Mike Smith here, uh, which uh, has been very, very important to the uh, deployment of wavelength division multiplexing in the internet. And th this is a detail of one such component where we've been able to really precisely control the geometries, the three-dimensional geometries, to get the losses down to almost immeasurable. So we're not losing photons due to the structure. Um, that's a big claim. It's buried in the measurement loys, so uh, just, just before we uh, get picked up on that one. But very, very low loss. And this is a little bit more recent, and uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time on it. It's, it's a modulator we've recently been making. On the top here, we see a conventional, state-of-the-art, gold standard lithium niobate modulator. It's about five centimeters long. Uh, that, that would give you the best performance you can get today. But it's big, uh, and it's, you know, the footprint is about you know, 1,000 millimeters square. This chip on the right, recently made, I've actually got one with me. You probably won't see it, that's the point. I'm gonna hold it up for you. That's how big a chip is that you can see there. 20 modulators, each capable of 100 gigahertz bandwidth. Now, if we can get our electronics right, that's four terabits. Off a chip that small. I find that incredibly exciting. Uh, and that's being developed here with our partners, Smart Photonics. If we compare the areas, we've gone from 1,000 millimeters square down to 0 0.4 millimeters square. Now, there's lots of ifs and buffs, but yeah, the electronics and the, the, uh, the connections are going to be a challenge, but the fundamentals are pretty exciting. We had a, a nice question earlier about what can we do in space with photonics? That's a fascinating, fascinating area. And if we can create building blocks that are sub-wavelength, we can structure our materials much, much smaller than the wavelength of light. We can start shaping light. We can direct light off a chip. And in this experiment, we've made a grating, a long grating, periodic changes in refractive index. And the light couples out, and it interferes in such a way that it creates a beam. This chip, again, it's not the same chip, but it's of this size, this order of this size. You can imagine a beam of light being generated in such a chip and focusing on the back wall. We could steer it across the back wall of this auditorium, I believe. I roughly did the numbers and assumed we were 50 meters. I think it's a little less. But yeah, that spot size would be of the order of centimeters. We'd be able to move it by the order of meters. Uh, it gives you an idea of what we might be able to do already with indoor wireless connections. So a very powerful technique, and what we're trying to do is build all these building blocks within the same manufacturing platforms. Which leads me nicely on to advanced circuits using building blocks. And yeah, that, that is the ambition. We want functional circuits that do useful work. And we want to do it all in the same way so that you know, they can be produced in the same process. Uh, so it's a really mainstream technology in electronics. It has been for decades. Uh, but I think until about five years ago, it really was quite controversial in photonics. You know, people genuinely felt that you know, making lasers at the same time as modulators and interferometers, that was just too hard. Uh, but um, yeah, my, Mind, I think, takes a lot of the credit for this. This is now widely accepted. And in fact, I think it is now really accepted as the only way to accelerate circuit innovation. Uh, and a measure of that success, of course, is, is the foundry model that is being established in the Eindhoven area. What can we do with such uh, platforms, though? Well, a nice recent example, I won't go into too many, but a nice one that's quite topical, is quantum encryption. Yeah, how can we build chip scale solutions to really secure our data? In this case, um, a little bit of photoshopping, but uh, I think it's justified. But underneath that photoshopping, you see uh, a bright laser source 
very low noise, uh, with attenuations so you can get down to the single photon level, and really precisely balanced interferometers so that we can phase encode single photons and use this to distribute keys over the internet. Another interesting function we're looking at, how to get light back and forwards off the same fiber. It might seem a bit, uh, a bit counterintuitive, but um, if you do that with electronics, you send a signal out, you send it back at the same time, you've got a big problem. They interfere. Light's quite clever. Uh, photons don't necessarily interfere with each other. So you can send them out and have them come back. And if you're clever with the polarization and use magneto-optics, you can get them to return down different paths. So we can have one fiber or one connection, one antenna, sending out signals and receiving signals at the same time. This could actually radically change the way we imagine uh, communication devices. Um, so that's, and a final circuit concept that I think is quite valuable going forwards, combining many wavelengths. And here we've got some work on tunable lasers. Our tunable laser work is already quite broad in its coverage. We can go hundreds of nanometers, thousands of uh, uh, you know, terahertz scale and beyond, tens of terahertz. So that's already achievable in a reasonably mainstream technology. But what we've done in this circuit is we've combined four different sets of lasers that have been made at different wavelength bands. So we've tuned the wavelength, the center wavelengths, quite significantly by the order of you know, 50 nanometers. We're spreading across much wider ranges. We've got a single chip solution that could be generating hundreds, possibly even thousands of channels, depending on how we uh, wire it up. Uh, and that can be fast programmable. All the techniques we're working with, we can be tuning uh, the performance in phase at least, uh, with you know, 100 gigahertz in principle. So this could be a really powerful solution for decongesting networks. We could be reassigning capacity on the fly. And of course, it's, it's fun making these circuits, but ultimately we need to integrate into product, integrating into systems. Well, to some extent, that's Ton's work, so I'm not gonna go too far down that direction. But there's a little bit of work that we can do to help, I think. And within the scope of our integration research, we're looking at wafer-wafer bonding. How do we assemble electronic wafers and photonic wafers? Looking at self-assembly. How do we drop down a photonic chip onto another silicon technology and have it align itself so that we don't have to use any precision? Uh, to put some perspective on this, uh, electronic assembly is often self-assembled. You put it in an oven, it just finds its way around, drops down. Nobody has to interact with it. But a photonics circuit, often we need to control the placements with tens of nanometer accuracy. Uh, and the, the tooling for that is really quite challenging and it slows down uh, the, the production. Uh, so it, it, makes, it means we can't mass produce. So if we can come up with schemes that are mass producible, we're able to integrate photonics into mass producible technology. Uh, the final technology I mentioned is, is printing chips on silicon. And there we're doing new work on transfer printing, where you're able to detach directly onto arbitrary silicon uh, materials. To give a, a little bit of a flavor of this work, firstly, integrating photonics and electronics uh, a little motivation, a pictorial motivation. So we started, of course, with uh, you know, high-speed connections to, to our chips. We've got a very fast modulator in the middle there. It's a very small one as well, actually. That one's 50 microns long, uh, so um, 0.05 of a millimetre. Uh, and you can see here that the electrical connections are dominating at the moment. We've got a large capacitor. We've got uh, matching impedances to make sure that we don't get electrical reflections. So this is all quite big. Next step was to hook up with our friends in the IC group, uh, who were very capable uh, and able to design very fast drivers electronics. 
so that we can connect the driver electronics straight to the chip. And our bond wires are getting very small. We still haven't quite fixed this part yet. We've still got a bit of decoupling going on. Uh, but, uh, but this did enable much faster performance. Uh, and that was a major, major step forward. Uh, and more recently, we've been integrating by placing these chips directly onto uh, material silicon germanium uh, circuits from NXP. Uh, and this has been very promising. We've, we've been able to, to, to create modular uh, detectors already with uh, wideband transimpedance amplifiers. We've demonstrated lasers running on top of this technology. I think that's probably a world first. And um, it's, it's clearly a route to miniaturization uh, and mass manufacturability. I should highlight that while we do a lot of uh, technology and production research here in Eindhoven, in this particular pl uh, work pr plan, uh, we've been working with the industry because we're very keen to see that we could do this in a production environment. Uh, and a final example, we have a wafer scale test and assembly. Uh, this is, is analogous, I think. It's, it's the same sort of technique that we have for self-assembly. Uh, and the challenge that I identified earlier, uh, we're trying to connect wave, uh, light beams that are defined within micron waveguides uh, into other systems. And if it's a micron wide, we need to care about displacements, errors in alignment of, of orders tens of nanometers. And yet, yeah, mass, mass production tools, they, they are very robust to many microns. These experiments here that you see, we've been able to etch and create waveguides that are freestanding like fingers. And these fingers drop down onto another microchip, lodge in place. We can be quite inaccurate when they come down, you know, off, off by about half, uh, four microns. But once they push in, and they can push in by a solder reflow, they lock in place with lithographic accuracy. So we, we achieve that 10 nanometer accuracy because they're just slotted in uh, by the mask definition, by software, effectively. And we've been able to do this very reproducibly with tens of optical connections, very small pitches, uh, and very reproducible uh, excess losses of, of below half a dB. So it's a very promising uh, going forwards for assembly with other silicon and panel-based technologies. I've talked mostly on the topic of uh, communication. I felt it's appropriate just to say a couple of words on what other opportunities may arise. Uh, and yeah, much of the work we do is, is actually looking at sensor and imaging technologies. Uh, and some of the fascinating opportunities we're seeing coming forwards, certainly with our industry uh, collaborators and friends, uh, is, is looking at uh, infrastructure measurement, uh, imaging. Photon First, a very nice example, they have placed fiber optic sensors with photonic chip readouts in the building so they can detect tremors. They can detect earthquakes coming. Uh, you can embed this sort of thing in rail networks. Companies are starting to do this already. You can embed it in bridges. You may be aware that we're seeing critical fails in some, some, some bridges around the world. To be able to predict that months in advance would change uh, how we maintain and design infrastructure. And in the center, we have the autonomous vehicle, uh, new robotic systems, being able to image with precision the example I gave earlier about having, being able to image, uh, send a beam to the back of the room, well, we can actually see the reflected signal as well. We can measure that reflected signal and build up an image of what is up there. We could use that in a car. We could see at speed what is 200 meters ahead of us. This is the technology that can be chip scale. And beyond that still, uh, we'll hear from uh, Patty Stabil later on, opportunities in neuromorphic computing. Uh, quantum secure data exchange, and of course, I hinted at it earlier, software-defined networking. Uh, and this all plays to, to the combination of speed, the capacity, the precision, the parallelism that we can achieve using photons. It closes my presentation. Uh, 
just, just to emphasize again, I think there's real opportunities because of the, it's the fundamental nature of the photon. Uh, we really get this bandwidth that we're all craving without the compromises. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Kevin. It's supposed to work. Oh, it works. Uh, questions for Kevin. Questions, questions. Too many questions. Don, you want to ask something? <laughs> I saw you moving. No, no. Connecting to the discussion about optical wireless, I think you, you showed this example that you mentioned. We are as system people very keen on seeing how, how soon can we have it in a box. Can you say something about the maturity of these technologies? When do you, can we expect them in the, in the processes, for example? Well, I, th I, I question your premise of your question, actually. Okay, that's good. That's what what do you consider the box to be? I mean, when we're miniaturizing to the point we've got microchips, the box could be anything now. It's true. So, um, yeah, there are packaging technologies coming on stream. There are hermetic seals coming on stream. Uh, yeah, if we're clever about the photonics, we can operate at higher temperatures and you know, don't have to worry about metals too much anymore. So, um, yeah, I don't know the answer to your question, uh, but I think we need you know, strong guidance from systems group as well to really make sure that we get, that, uh, get the form right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And you, you, you deliver the blow to our electronics people by saying that the photonics is now doing everything but the electronics is the bottleneck? Is in it practice, so bad? Are we practice, really in uh, up against it? Or they are practice, up against it? No, I, I think that was a, a careless remark, and it's good that you picked me up on it, because I'm sure others will pick me up on it too. Uh, Some of them we, are in this room, so... Uh, yes, one of them smiling <laughs> at me right now. So, so there's incredible, uh, incredible progress in terahertz CMOS, for example. Indium phosphide electronics is incredibly powerful. I don't take it away from that. Uh, but when it comes to a mainstream technology that is good DC, almost DC, through to 100 gig, 400 gig, we struggle. We do. And it's not just the electronic chips. I generalized a little bit. It's, it's the way we connect between electronic chips and photonics. That is incredibly important. And that's what's limiting us. Yeah, that's, I, can, I can understand that. Any more questions from the audience? Yes, please. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm quite from another um, uh, direction. Uh, I am a political scientist and political philosopher. Um, if I understand your uh, presentation, uh, the new technology makes the world um, omnipresent, connected everything to everything, wireless, and in real time. Well, uh, since uh, the discovery of God in theology, that has never existed before in the history of mankind. And that means that everybody can explain what everybody does wherever in the, in the world. So that scares me from an ethical point of view. And is, uh, are that uh, ethical argumentation also a part of your research? I sympathize a lot with your question, actually. That's incredibly important. And I think that's going really quite to the heart of our teaching and education within the university now. Um, does it go to the heart of our research? I think our research is motivated um, by, by use cases that really are quite powerful in our health, in our safety. But uh, a surveillance society that you're, you're referring to, I think there are serious questions there. I absolutely agree. Uh, I know it's not a good answer, but uh, we, we don't look at use cases in my own research team, so I, we collaborate on that. But I think as a university, we have to take responsibility. I agree. Thank you. That's the risk of having a general public, right? And, and they the have, value. They have the general value. interest. Very good questions, indeed. Um, all right, we're running out of time. Kevin, thank you very much you. for your presentation. Let's thank you again. <laughs> and our next speaker is from the industry. Herlas, where is Herlas? Yes. So our next speaker is the CEO of, of uh, Genexis, and, uh, and he will find his presentation here, I'm sure. And uh, he's uh, one of us. He studied here, so, right? Actually, I didn't. You didn't? <laughs> oh, see, I missed it completely. But Sorry. that's okay. <laughs> Let's see how this works. Uh, 
This is the other one. Can you give me a hand here? Because it's... You mean to leave you stranded here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's see what goes on here. Uh... And this one, right? No, the one on top. I clicked it. Oh, there it is. And then you s and then no, you want slide. to go to the slide, first slide, and then you want to start. Yes, thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, as Odette said, uh, my name is Gerla Svendenhoven. And first, I'd like to personally thank Ton Conan, Professor Ton Conan, for a fantastic collaboration that has lasted for more than 20 years. Um, you've, you've always aimed to build the bridge between science and application and between the university and the industry. And today, I hope to show you that your vision uh, and your faculty have helped to make that a reality. Um, the title is Too Much Broadband is Never Enough. I know it sounds a bit like a James Bond movie title, and I think that's quite uh, timely because I think the uh, release of the movie is uh, imminent. Imagine you're over here. Imagine you're in the desert. It's hot and there's just a little bit of water. The only thing you can think of is to make sure your camels drink because they can take you back to civilization where you might be able to have a drink too. When resources are limited, we automatically restrict ourselves to the bare necessities. And now, consider this picture. The last thing you think about is drinking all this water, right? If you imagine the possibilities, you see energy, you see transport, you, you might see things like agriculture and for sure entertainment, right? Um, if there's an abundance, the possibilities become limitless. But in recent times, we've been limited uh, in fact, today I'll talk about the endless uh, possibilities of broadband internet connectivity, but we also have to consider the world in which we live. This place used to be packed with people, and now it's nearly apocalyptic, as if only the pigeons survived. And it's not only the scenery that has changed, our experience of life in the past years have changed. We couldn't go outside anymore to meet friends after a long day of hard work. We couldn't share the experience of that first sip of cold beer on a hot summer day. Everything that we used to do and that we took for granted came to a halt. But we did find ways to change. We adapted to the circumstances. And we continued our lives online. Obviously, we continued. Um, and we used tools like Skype and FaceTime, Teams and Zoom, I think we're using Teams today even. We continue to live our lives, but we did it differently. It's probably the most interesting social experiment for a philosopher. <laughs> um, we started to work from home. We changed our, the, our whole work-life pattern. We educated our children from home. We did our shopping from home. We ordered food from home. And of course, we also relaxed from home. And let's be honest, Probably most of you have been watching a movie sequel for the, the, in the extended version for the third time or watched whole series uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, a, in a row. And we've come to notice how important it is to be connected, to be connected to the internet, and how important it is that that connection is stable and reliable and strong. And that, of course, it covers your whole home because you don't want to be in the garden and then, oh, no connectivity, can't do my work from here, or can't enjoy a movie from here. And it's already mentioned uh, in a couple of other presentations uh, today, fiber to the home. And here I show you some statistics uh, and some predictions. Um, the, the graph in red shows the number of homes that have access to fiber in Europe. Uh, and as you can see, these, this will grow to more than 300 million homes in Europe. Uh, in uh, 2026, and I believe that's more than 75% of the homes. 
And in blue, you see the number of homes that actually take a subscription from that fiber network. Uh, and that take rate is growing even faster uh, and will reach about 60% of all European homes in just five years. So there's big numbers and there's big potential. And I'm not the first to show a machine like this today um, because we also know that this huge demand uh, for connectivity and communication requires a similar growth in electronic devices. And as we learned today also, that growth is exponential. Um, the, all the devices that you use, they require integrated chips. And you've undoubtedly uh, seen on the news uh, that there is a chip shortage. Uh, and everyone is experiencing this firsthand. I know that people have ordered a car and are waiting a year for it. Uh, you, you just can't get your products anymore. And to put it in perspective, uh, ASML, uh, one of the top companies in the Netherlands uh, and in Europe, and just around the corner uh, from here, uh, reports fantastic sales numbers. Uh, they, they reported 4 billion net sales and more than 1 billion in net income in one quarter. But there's still a shortage. And this reflects also the growth in our industry. It's not just those exponential curves. Now, when there's huge growth, it also makes us very, very vulnerable. Remember this ship? that blocked the entire global logistics. Imagine that your products that you're waiting for are on here, or the products that your business bought and you're depending on for your income. So the question is, what is really going on? And in my view, we are just starting to see the effects of the digital society. More and more people are using broadband you all are using broadband, and everyone wants a better, higher quality connection. We want to be connected throughout our homes, and we want all those devices that we buy to be connected. And yes, I also don't know where it's going to lead us uh, in 50 years, um, but this is the way the world is going. And all these devices connect to the internet. So. I think we're really at a tipping point. The way I see it is that there was a time, you could say, before COVID, let's call it the BC era, before COVID. <laughs> and now we're entering a new era. I call it the AD era, the Aegis Digitalis. In other words, we are now really entering the future. And basically, that is the theme of my presentation today. Because the future is coming, but how should we prepare for it? What solutions do we require? The choices that we're going to make today are going to have big impact, and not just on ourselves, but very much on others and future generations. And therefore, your question was exactly spot on. We don't know. But one thing is clear for us. The future does require connectivity, and Fiber is going to play a key role in that. Let me talk a little bit about uh, our company, Genexis, because we are active in creating products to enable this fiber future. We create products for network operators and internet service providers where you take your broadband subscription, but we also care about the consumer behind that, because those are the users in the end. And so we provide our solutions for everybody in that chain. And when we do that, we always try to remember that we are preparing the network for the future and hope we can build a positive impact. Because we do believe uh, uh, that people deserve fiber. We believe that, that fiber connectivity is, in, in essence, uh, a right. It's something where you access to information, where you access to the world. And we've seen in recent times how important that has been. When we say people deserve fiber, we want to provide that nearly endless speed 
throughout, to the home and distribute that throughout the home. Because basically when this lady asks for fast Wi-Fi, what she really needs is the speed that fiber provides. And to go back to human terms, we want to enable her to work from home in the way that she likes. We want to enable this father to coach his children so that he can prepare them for their futures. And in the end, we want to put a smile on this girl's face. Because that's what we do, that's why we do it. And I believe it's, it's not just our company, it's everybody in, in this, in this uh, auditorium. We want people to enjoy life. We want people to participate in society. We want people to be able to do their work and to interact with people, with other people. We want to enable people to be part of this new digital society. And we want to put smiles on their faces because it's not just work and study, it's also about fun. And therefore we say everyone deserves fiber. Um, and the common thread in these pictures you just saw, you don't even see the fiber because of course as a user, you're not directly interacting with it, but you do need that fiber to have the, the connectivity to that broadband internet. And you need all that technology that is being developed here at the university and in the industry to be able to make that a reality. At Genexis, we've made it our mission to be part of making, to making this a reality. And basically we say we want to get from fiber to the home to Wi-Fi to the tablet to make it really usable for humans. So if you take a look at that home, uh, you, you can see how on, on the, uh, the right-hand side at the bottom, the fiber enters the home, comes to a box. The box translates this fiber signal into an electrical signal uh, and then distributes that to the next box, uh, which is then a, a router, the typical router modem that you might get from your internet service provider. And, now, and then that signal needs to be distributed, typically in a wireless way, throughout the network to other boxes, which ensure that you have great Wi-Fi connectivity throughout the home. And all this, of course, should be one easy-to-use, easy-to-manage network. And, and we believe that it should be easy. When, when a technology should be made available for humans, it should be easy. So just as one example of something we do is we make it in such a way that it can be sent to the end user and the end user can just click it on. So we try to make fiber to the home easy. And then uh, with uh, the products we deliver, we try to go all the way from fiber to the home to broadband to the tablet. As I said, starting on the left with what we call fiber termination, where we provide products for all the different protocols. So there's many different ways to, to connect your home to the internet, uh, uh, either on uh, what's called GPON, which is a passive optical network, uh, to XGSPON, which is a 10 gigabit passive optical network, point-to-point uh, -point networks, which pr can provide even higher and more dedicated bandwidth of one gigabit and 10 gigabit. And uh, when we started uh, the company uh, nearly 20 years ago, it was all 100 megabit. Now we're talking 10 gigabit. In 10 years from now, we're gonna be talking 100 gigabit. And in another 10 years, a terabit to the home. Can you imagine that? Who could have imagined 10 gigabit to the home? Could any of you have imagined that? We are delivering those products today in fact, to a rather large service provider in the Netherlands, so you could even take a subscription. Um, and of course, behind that, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's these, these modems, these residential gateways, these routers uh, that will provide you access to the services you need. In the end, many people still make a phone call, or they want to access the internet, of course, preferably through Wi-Fi. And that all has to be managed. Uh, so even though we build products, I would say three quarters of our engineers are software people. Uh, the software runs all these products and that is also one of the big challenges uh, for the coming years. The software is becoming so complex. There's no single human being that can understand it all anymore. 
Uh, so uh, it's going to start to lead a life of its own. And uh, who knows where that's going to uh, end up. There's movies about that too. So what are the challenges? Um, I think some of them have been mentioned today already. Uh, connectivity to the home, fiber to the home, is going to more than a gig, more than one gigabit per second. And people also want symmetrical speeds. In the past, it was great to get internet, but now you, you, you also store things in the cloud. You interact through teams. So the, the, the communication goes two ways, which means the connection also needs to work with the same quality and the same speed in both directions. We're a very strong believer on open networks. Uh, our industry, the telecommunications industry, has, has been very closed. 40 years ago, most of the telecommunications companies were state-owned. In the Netherlands, we had the PTT. Um, and in, in other countries, uh, uh, something similar. Uh, and they were closed. They, they dominated the telecommunications scene. The market, of course, now is open. Um, and we are working very much uh, and, and advocating for open standards so that in, equipment can interact and interrupt with each other. And this is especially true in the areas of passive optical networking, but also Wi-Fi. Of course, when you buy a piece of Wi-Fi equipment online, maybe you buy a, a nice uh, uh, speaker uh, for, for your television set, or you buy uh, a radio uh, that, that uses Wi-Fi, you would like that immediately to work in a standardized way. And of course, things must be cost efficient. It's the consumer paying. And, uh, all this high-tech technology uh, has a price. Um, but I'm really thrilled uh, to hear, uh, Kevin, your, 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 your talk, where you're miniaturizing. And I know when you miniaturize, you don't just make the performance better. You also make the cost lower. And that really helps, because it's the consumer paying. And it has to fit everyone's budget. Otherwise, it will be a technology for the elite. And this picture is completely wrong. I don't know why that's the case. Um, I'm not going to try to repair it, because it's a scientific picture. And good scientists, of course, can just rotate 90 degrees and then understand everything. Um, this is a picture of a, a project that we did with, uh, uh, with uh, Tom Conan and his group, uh, whereby we, uh, we tried to make high speed but very versatile, very flexible networks where you can deliver the, the exact needed bandwidth at the right time, at the right moment, to the right place using photonic technologies uh, uh, whereby we can uh, switch and guide light uh, to the correct home. Um, uh, I still have fantastic memories of this project and I can see the second slide is also as bad as the first one. No clue why I did that. Um, uh, but uh, you can see a very funky looking array of, of filters which can be actively controlled to, to guide the light to the right place. And it is research like this that helps, that helps bring the industry to the next level and helps uh, us move uh, in the right direction. Uh, so just one example of the very many that have been there in, in the last 20 years. Um, I talked a little bit uh, about um, the passive optical networking lock-in, about this uh, open interoperability. And also, this is an area where I know uh, science and industry have worked together very well uh, to bring things to the next level. Lastly, let me mention um, software. Um, software is crucial. Uh, and especially open software is crucial. Uh, when software becomes closed, it becomes controlled uh, by in, most likely a particular company who can do everything uh, with that software. Uh, c closed software makes it, makes, often makes it easier uh, uh, to build, uh, but it also uh, makes it very, um, I would say, uh, it, it gives big problems for the future uh, because uh, it, it, it basically 
creates monopoly positions. We believe in open software. Um, so when we develop our software, uh, we base it on open source uh, uh, platforms. And of course, you have to build things on that. You have to make it work. You have to uh, continuously work to, to get a router to the, uh, uh, the public that is usable, that is easy, easy to use, and, and does the things that you as a consumer want. Um, but in the end, we believe it has to be based on openness. Because then I'll go a little bit back to the more philosophical approach. In the end, uh, it's not about technology. It's about people, right? It's you and me, uh, our friends and family, our colleagues. It's basically everyone in the world. And uh, as we've seen, uh, we, we know, it, let's say, we know um, instinctively, I would say, uh, that interaction is part of being a human being. Without interaction, humans would not exist. Um, I read in a book that uh, it could be one of the, the key reasons why we humans uh, the, uh, have, have become the dominant race on Earth. Because uh, other, uh, let's say, human-like uh, um, uh, creatures, if you will, uh, communicated less. They were stronger than us. They, they were probably even smarter than us. But they didn't communicate. They didn't interact. And it's this interaction that gives us the progress. And that's exactly, I think, what we're building. When we're building communication technology, we are building interact, the possibility for us to interact with each other. And as you've seen with the, the virus recently, uh, it was really key that those interaction possibilities were there. It made us stronger, and it helped us take care of each other. And of course, when people and interaction come together, it creates life. And since we are working on communication in the home, uh, everybody thinks mobile phones and 4G, 5G, and who knows, 6G and 7G. But actually, you spend most of your time at home. That's where it happens. So I'd like to uh, close off with just giving you a few examples of innovations that have taken place in the home, and then asking you how you see that they have impacted the world. Take this example. This lady is using a washboard. Uh, I ask it to some young people, they don't even know what it is. Uh, and of course, they do know what the, uh, the picture on the right-hand side is. And then I say, I ask, so what, what did it change? Well, you know, it, it took less time to do the washing. And similarly, the invention of light, or even broader electricity, made our lives simpler, uh, easier in a way. It saved us time. Um, and I've lived in Africa as a kid, and I've seen children and women, it was typically never the men, walking with water, bringing it for, for, for miles and miles. And now we just open the tap. That also saved time. But if you really think about it, it did something much, much more. These inventions, they made our lives easier, but they also changed things dramatically. All the domestic appliances gave women the possibility to do other things, to participate in society, to get a job. Things like electricity and good water enable children to spend time at school instead of carrying water and after dark, well, no time to do anything else. So I believe uh, that making things easy can have a huge impact on the world. And that's why we say making communication easy really is the key to a better world. Uh, and just repeat, what I believe in is that people deserve fiber. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Herles. Uh, very exciting presentation. Uh, questions? Yes, there's a question there. Oh, excellent. I don't have to think so hard. No, no, they need to hear you back on the stream. Uh, it's complicated. Thank you, thank you, Gerlas, for a very nice and excited presentation. Uh, my question is something that 
a similar question I give to my students. Uh, when we speak uh, during the course, I can easily say it's no problem to give 10 gig, uh, 15 gig even, to the, to the home. So it's not a big issue actually, it's a question of money, that's all. So what we are going to do with this? Can you give your vision what we really can do with this kind of stuff? And in one terra, I will be really excited to listen. Yeah. Well, thanks for the question. So the, the, the question is, what are we going to do with all that bandwidth? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, but the thing is, if you look back, uh, what, what were we going to do with, with that 10 megabit or that 1 megabit? And now it's not just not enough. Uh, as I said, uh, we're providing 10 gigabit. Uh, and of course, you don't need 10 gigabit today. Um, but it means that there are uses for this. Uh, obviously, the quality of everything you get is much higher. The, the resolution on your TV screen is much better. Um, uh, uh, a lot of, of things are going back and forth to the cloud. Uh, there's a lot of interactive services. Um, there's, uh, I can look on my smartphone and, and, and check at home to see how things are going. Of course, uh, that's a a surveillance thing, but it's a surveillance that I control myself. So I can, I can be at home and still be on the road uh, and be connected to things that go on in the home. And it's a little bit this question, uh, applications come when the data is there. Uh, and, it's, and I think my story is not only about we should just m try to maximize that, it's also we should bring that connectivity to as many people on the world as we can. So uh, there's many people that don't have even one megabit per second. If we can get access to them, they can also take part in society. And as a whole, it will grow. And where it will end, I don't know. Thank you. More questions? Another one. Nikola, you're really curious. Very good. Excellent. <laughs> Sorry. I had to stay with you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Actually, I get the same answer from the students, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> they also don't know, and they're young, so I'm very curious what he's going to invent. See, I, I can allow myself not to know because I'm, I'm, exactly. I'm over 50, but yeah. the students, exactly. they need to know. That's why I'm asking them. I, I have an answer later on to them. Uh, okay, another point is about, uh, you probably you see, like you say, after, the, after this COVID, what happened is that a lot of people cannot go to the stadium, right? So what happened, most of them look... Uh, in real time, right, uh, problems to look at games at home. Now, if you listen, maybe in Italy we have this problem like uh, 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 D-Zone that has completely blocked it, and a lot of people complain. Now my question, is this because they don't have enough capacity at home or because actually the network, the automatization and the problems come before? So how do you see this as well? Yeah, I, I think your question is, you know, sometimes there are blockages in the network uh, and they, the, the network is a very complicated thing. It's not just about the connection to the home. Um, uh, it, it's, it, it can have to do with uh, the particular application, the server, the cloud. Um, I, I think we, we're creating a digital world. Uh, there's a, a digital infrastructure being created I really like to remark about you can wrap a, a fiber uh, 250,000 times around the earth. Um, if you try, really try to imagine it, or, or 33 times back and forth to, to the sun. Um, we are creating a digital infrastructure, and like with any infrastructure, there is going to be traffic jams. We know them, and you in Italy, for sure you know them. Uh, 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 if you don't design infrastructure the right way, or if you design it the right way, but then somehow you outgrew that infrastructure, which is probably the case in Italy, then, then you're, you're in a jam. And, if, and, and therefore you need to upgrade and maintain, uh, and, and it's going to be like with any infrastructure, continuous work. Um, it, you don't just build it and, and keep it there. It's, I think we have to realize it's work, and it's not just work on the infrastructure, but it's also work on understanding where this is going. When you build a society, you're going to need rules. And then coming back maybe to the more philosophical question that was, was asked earlier, right? You, you, you're going to have to understand. First thing is to understand that you need to build rules. Uh, I don't think our politics understands that yet. 
th this is a different society with different infrastructure. You know, in, in cars, you can say you drive on the left side or the right side of the road, depending on whether you're from the, the UK or whether you're from Europe, right? Uh, but that's an easy to solve problem, relatively easy. This is a really complicated problem where, where I think we also need to spend some time. A bit of a broader answer to your specific question, but I hope you like it. Thanks a lot. In due of time, we have to thank you again for your presentation. Thank you very much. And we move to our last speaker, Betty Stabile. Uh, yes, it's here, somewhere. Uh, yes. <laughs> the left with much time, I guess, right? Hmm. Good. Okay. Yeah, so um, uh, thanks uh, for uh, inviting me to this sh sh symposium, Ton. Um, and um, it's really an honor to be here, and uh, I, I have to grab this opportunity to thank you, uh, perhaps on behalf of all the group, to support us personally and also professionally along our uh, career. And you keep doing that, so really thank you so much for your, uh, for your help and support. Um, having said so, uh, so this is a quite, quite a, a new topic. Uh, it started about 2016-2017. It, it is a, about all optical integrated neural networks, and I have to thank a lot uh, my students, which is also here, which uh, did most of the of the work. Of course, the col collaboration with Nicola Calabretta. Um, and uh, yeah, I will start the presentation then, um, perhaps without outline, so that we save a bit of time. Um, so, as has been said already from uh, the previous speakers, uh, we, are, uh, um, we have entered this uh, zettabyte era. Zettabyte means that every year we uh, created 10 to the power of 21 uh, data, and uh, that's a lot of data, and uh, it needs faster and more efficient information processing. Um, and what you see here is a supercomputer, and uh, it, the fastest supercomputer can execute up to 100 billions of mega operations per second, but it really at the astonishing price of 10 million watts, which is enough for 1,300 households. Um, so this is one part of the problem, but there is another problem which connects also with what Peter was talking about, this computing gap. So it's true that this is very expensive, but on the other side, we really um, need to uh, catch up on this computing gap. Computing resources are uh, lacking behind what we actually need to, to, to process, which is a lot of data of order of tens of zettabytes now. And if we start doing a naive, uh, um, let's say, comparison with our brain, I know that is very naive, uh, but this is all about an opportunity. The brain uh, is, has been demonstrated that can execute about the same, um, the same uh, order of magnitude operations, so about 10 billion or mega operations, but only 20 watts uh, cons uh, power consumption. So what we see here is a, is a, is a big opportunity. What if uh, we design supercomputer which, um, let's say, resemble the way the, inter the, the brain works, uh, the way the neurons are interconnected. Um, and that all uh, starts. So why, what are artificial neural networks? Artificial neural networks are information processing models which are inspired by the brain. And uh, there are many uh, flavors of those, um, and uh, normally uh, they tend to really mimic uh, all the small uh, processing we, which happening within the neurons. But most of the case, uh, we tend to mimic the brain interconnectivity and the parallel computation. And this has been already uh, shown that, has, uh, uh, that works very well with uh, with things that actually we can do very well, but the computer cannot, and these are like voice recognition, or badly handwritten digits, or um, object recognition. And uh, of course, the hope is that we can use these to uh, also for higher bandwidth applications like sensing or data transmission or autonomous driving. Um, and uh, just to, 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 to mention that artificial neural network concept has been there already in, 15, in 1950. Uh, why are they so powerful now? Because they rely, rely only on the presence of massive data sets. Only if we train the neural networks having a massive data sets, they will be able to predict very accurately the outcome 
of your, uh, let's say, engine, of your, of your um, yeah, process. So it's now that, uh, that we generate massive data sets that we can use actually artificial neural network. It's a bit of a strange, but let's say the solution calls uh, the problem <laughs> back. Um, but that is the way it works. And artificial neural networks are not that complex as the, as the brain, of course, or as the biological networks, but are more simplified, uh, much more simplified um, uh, systems. So you see here a bench of uh, uh, let's say white uh, balls, and these are the neurons, um, and they are stacked in layers. So we may have, uh, uh, sorry, I thought, yeah, we we have different layers. The more layers we have, and uh, you you will call the network. In this case, this is a feed-forward network because your data comes from the left and it goes towards the right. Um, you can have a shallow or deep uh, neural networks. So, so just to connect to what you to, you tend to to hear. Um, on the television, on the internet. And uh, the most basic uh, model of a neuron is actually this one. It, it contains two main operations. One is a linear operation, which is all about algebraic operations. So what you have is a multiplication factor times the input, and then you have here a summation of all the outputs at this point. So this is our linear part. But that is followed by a nonlinear part, so a nonlinear function, which is also called activation function is a sort of threshold um, that if the output at this point reach out that threshold, then the neuron, you say that, uh, fires, which means that it sent uh, the data from, from where it is to the next neurons uh, at the end of, of the synapses, at the end of the synapses. Um, what I want to mention is from now on we will talk about interference, inference, sorry. So we just run these engines, but we won't talk about the training. So training a network is very important. It's really all the things that you do to make sure that that, that engine um, actually allow you to send in uh, a certain number of data and then, for example, be able to recognize this, uh, this badly written to, to be a two or this badly written seven to be a seven. So it's uh, the training, actually, which allow you to do that. And uh, the more data you use to train this network, and the most, more accurate they will be. Um, so I hope that was clear. It has a, a sense now to, to know where are we in terms of computing hardware. And when we do that, of course, we need to uh, relate to electronics. And this is uh, uh, probably two years old, the graph, but I, I tend to keep it because it's really nicely, uh, I think, sorted out. And then you'll see why. And of course, for who is curious, you can look at this very nicely written paper on, uh, on the electronic state of the art. Um, so what happened in electronics, as this has been already mentioned by, by Peter, um, is that, uh, of course, when the conventional computers were not enough, uh, people were starting moving into the accelerator, into GPUs, into TPUs, by adding up uh, um, computational units. Um, in this way, they managed, in fact, to, to increase the computational speed that we need. So the number of operations, this is a multiplication and accumulation operation, uh, means um, per, uh, per unit of time. Um, so this is... Uh, looking at what that means, means that we use parallel operation, and this is also very similar to what happens in, an, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a brain. So let's say that uh, already when you do GPU, you do a sort of neuromorphic computing, if, you want, if we want to say it that way. But by doing that, actually, you um, increase linearly also. The, your power consumption will scale linearly with the number of computation, uh, computing units that you add up. That means that your energy efficiency stays always st stuck to a certain level. But at the same time, also in electronics, uh, people have been starting uh, thinking about why don't we do things uh, in a way that we look, we get more inspired to the brain. And therefore, they were starting working with the neuromorphic electronics. There is a lot of uh, work uh, ongoing. And immediately what you see is that they managed to get the energy efficiency that they were looking at. That means that this way to do things actually help you to be more energy efficient as the brain is. Um, so what we see, though, is that they, they tend to, of course, that doesn't work at some point. It's always like that in my presentations. But uh, um, what happens then is that uh, um, they were tra trading the in interconnectivity with the bandwidth. So it's true that they are gaining a bit more of energy efficiency, but they are stuck with the bandwidth. And that's, therefore, we see two different walls. One is the energy efficiency wall. The other one is the computing speed walls. And what we want to do is to try to overtake 
take both limits. And we think, and we are of course not the only one to think about uh, that that is possible, that computing with light can allow you to be faster and more energy efficient. Why? Because, and this is also connected to what Kevin was, was, was mentioning, we can rely on parallel operation, which is already something that in GPU they do. We can uh, do interconnectivity, with something that also in electronic do, but we will do one-shot calculations, which means that once the light enters into your, your engine, you will, in one clock cycle, or let's say in one shot, do all the calculations at the speed of light. Um, so they are, these are the keys of our engines, and this is the reason why this, uh, this, this field is really gaining a lot of uh, um, attention in this uh, period. And uh, I will skip these slides. These are really the fathers of the first chip which have been created. I will just tell you that uh, the best, let's say, the first chip that created this, this new field, actually, is a chip from MIT, uh, which, uh, let's say, was quoting that they were doing deep neural networks. But actually, in their chip, there was, there was even not half a neuron, um, just to be uh, honest. There were just multiple uh, one-third neurons, so a layer one-third of neurons. Um, and uh, that, that was what we had in 2017. Um, so we can just uh, suggest, and I will just be a bit fast here, that there is quite some difficulty to scale these engines, and we, uh, we should increase a bit uh, more the accuracy. So um, this is just to talk about what we, we do, but uh, perhaps I will uh, just move to the chip. Um, let me just go into this chip because this connects also to the work we have done uh, with, with Kevin. Um, and this is uh, yeah, a chip which in the past we have been used for, uh, for showing ultra-fast switching um, um, in, uh, yeah, in, in, the, in networks, in optical networks. But in this case was used to demonstrate that we actually have already co-integrated on a chip eight linear neurons uh, with the 64 synapses. Just to see how can we check the correlation um, between what we see here and what we actually have on the chip. Um, so you will see that you have eight inputs, and we can input in each of the inputs uh, up to eight wavelengths, but this is depending on the, the filters that we are using here. We have the shuffle network, because this shuffle network is exactly identical to this shuffle network. And then here we have just some filters for noise rejection. And then we have a, a matrix of weight, which are actually the weight factor that you use to multiply to the inputs. And then you will sum up at some point here through the use of broadband optical couplers, um, just to identify where are the neurons. So this is one neurons with uh, eight inputs. And yeah, you have a stack of neurons on chip. You can simply remove this part because it has not been used in this chip. So the chip can be much, much smaller. And now on the IMOS uh, uh, technology can be even, even, even uh, smaller. Um, so, um, what kind of experiments we do on this network? I will skip these two first slides. It's, it's what I told you before, but this is like nice because it, takes, uh, it is a toy example, of course, you will recognize it's a toy example, but uh, it's easy to understand that you have an image, uh, you, have, you know that this image is an iris flower, but you don't know, or you want to know if it is, which species it is, if it is a setosa, or if it is a versicolor, or if it is a virginica. Um, species. How do you do that? You need to access to four attributes of these uh, flowers. It can be the length or the width of the sepal or of the petal. Okay, so you want to, you have this engine, you don't know what it is, you have a black box, this is an engine which has been previously trained, and you send in different attributes into the engines and you want to know at the end. Is that uh, which species is this one? So your engine, in this case, using neural networks, will do exactly that one. Will classify what image that is. Um, and we have done uh, um, quite a, some experiments with this because we wanted to understand if uh, it is better. And this is, is one of the research challenges in this period. It is better to have one single chip where you have only one, new, one layer of neurons inside and then you come out into the electrical domain and you come in again into the optical domain and so on so forth uh, and so forth 
Um, or it is better to, let's say, try to scale and add up more neurons onto a single chip to be more accurate. So we have done those sort of uh, um, experiments. And uh, let's say when you start doing these experiments, you, you need to you get out this uh, classification accuracy. And you see what you have at the bottom there. You, have, you send in different attributes, and you see at the output if you really get it right or not. 42, the first part is very right. The second column, you know that you have made one error. 26 is right, nine is an error. And the last column, it, it was right. So in that case, you get a classification accuracy. What we did is to investigate if, you, if it is better to have an all optical network. And sorry if I won't, I won't be specific, but what we, we were trying to understand here, if it was better to have all on a chip or if it was better to do an hybrid uh, computation. So what we understood eventually is that an all optical uh, um, uh, implementation, so trying to have more and more neurons into the single chip would work better because of course you avoid to have the noise um, attributed to the analog to digital conversions. Um, and um, yeah, so this is the kind of investigation we did it, and there are many more trying to integrate on a single chip uh, uh, full neurons, and also to, to try to investigate what happens when you stay in the optical domain multiple times. So this is all in the optical domains, and you see what happens uh, when you stay in the optical domain. Um, and what we understood is that the accuracy visibly improved, and also you still you even have a net layer again, which allows you to understand that you can really have, can scale up to more uh, levels. Important slides are the two ones, the last two ones. Um, there are many, many more research challenges, as you see. I've started with half a neuron on chip, then we moved to eight neurons on chip. Uh, there are many more research challenges that we have to address, and for sure understanding about the scalability. Um, yeah, and of course, Kevin has helped us to understand to which level we can push uh, our chip. Um, the end-to-end -end system performance, and this is something that Peter would, uh, would for sure ask about, uh, where are we in, in that sense when we actually have the photonic engine and we connect it to the digital uh, world, what happens? Do we still gain or we don't? Um, we still keep, need to keep electronics as a reference. It doesn't have any um, sense to keep working and do just incremental work if electronics is just fastest, it will be always fastest. So we we need to keep electronics uh, um, as a reference and also try to uh, combine the world of mathematics, computer science, uh, and hardware to try to co design machine learning algorithms with the optical hardware um, because the optical hardware is an analog. Uh, chip and it has uh, noise uh, involved, it has low precision, so we need to take care of all these, uh, of the, of all these things. Um, in conclusion, I wanted to mention that our engine, but a multitude of other, our, uh, other engines which are, being, which are being developed in this period, follow in this class. The uh, top uh, GPU uh, computer that we can think of is an NVIDIA 800. It's about here, so we can guarantee about uh, almost a yeah, 100 mach per second with an energy efficiency of about uh, tera mach per joule. Um, I wanted to point out a very nice uh, uh, paper, 2D or not 2D in neuromorphic computing. Would that be um, better to make it in a planar way or we need to move into a 3D uh, integration scheme? Um, if we do that, and by doing end-to-end -end system performance calculations, actually we get that 3D photonics can overpass electronics. And finally, yes, again, I will just uh, say that uh, the combination of uh, the scalability of a new disruptive technology, which can be photonics, but can also be spintronic, and all will be uh, possible also within the, within the new Ford Institute that has been recently opened. And the work together with also colleagues from the mathematics department, I'm, I'm sure will, will allow us to fill in the computational gap that I was talking at the first slides. So that is all I wanted to tell you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Patty. Um, a very interesting talk. Maybe many, many questions, but I'll give the, the guest, guest of honor the chance to give one. Thank you, Odette. 
Thank you, Patty. Uh, as you said, you want to mimic the human brain, right? Uh, well, we also have memory in our brain, right? We have, sorry? Memory. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we tend also to, to memorize things. Yes, yes. So, do you foresee also in your schematics somewhere a role to put in optical memories and how? Yes, indeed. Uh, it's a very good question. And the answer, luckily, is already here because <laughs> I didn't talk more about this scheme. But in fact, the point is we need to look at uh, the memory functionality and we need to add up on top of wo what we already have. So uh, in principle, we can uh, live with the, the ultra low loss uh, properties of silicon nitride, for example. We have a fantastic platform for non-linearities, but we need the top part, you call it synaptic operation, that has to have a phase changing materials or some sort of materials which actually you program and keep staying where it is. So I'm really um, yeah, happy that you asked that in-memory computing, we call it, is very important concept that will enable us to, yeah, to overtake um, electronics and to make it really a uh, useful concept. So in fact, the 3D photonics was including already the memory concept. Thank you. Uh, we are beyond time. I'm really sorry, Patty, and thank you for being so so quick. It was really fascinating. Um, I want to thank all our speakers uh, for this afternoon, for this workshop. Uh, some of you, I hope, uh, are able to join us in uh, 40, 38 minutes for Ton's uh, presentations in, the, in the 4 o'clock. Um, I think we now have a coffee break. And uh, thank again for all the speakers and for you to coming and we'll see you, most of you, after the break.